Let's talk about career strategy. So building this out, let's start from the top. We went through at the beginning, what do you want? And I know the classic cliche, why always should precede what? If you're going to ask Simon Sinek, his seminal book of start with why I agree. However, I think it's often misplaced by most young strength coaches. It's a generational thing. This isn't, oh, this group wants this and young people don't get it. We were all naive. We were all short-sighted in terms of our thinking. And we were all thinking of this. What do I need to get today to become the coach that I can make a living or get the notoriety or whatever it is? So I, we should start with what? And I, I think too much when we talk to young coaches is this notion of be withholding of that information. Like somehow if I am vulnerable with what I want to accomplish or what am I trying to be that that will be held against me. And if it is probably not a good place to work, probably not a good mentor, probably not someone that has your best interest. Cause at the end of the day, anyone who's worth their weight and mentorship has any accrued wisdom will look at your, what desire to be something at this very vulnerable age of changing your mind as potentially something that's very high likely to change. And what I'm looking at when I ask you, what do you want is what, what do I need to motivate you and incentivize you to become the best coach you can possibly be? I know that's probably something that you could probably look at as right now that's going to be held against. I don't view it that way. Just like training, right? You tell me your goal. Now I know what standard I need to hit. I want to lose 30 pounds in three months. That's a, it's a big goal. It is a very, very high level. I need to do a lot of work. I need to make a lot of sacrifice to get that goal. Not impossible, but go take a very concerted effort. I want to be a high net worth strength conditioning coach. I want to make seven figures, or I want to be a professional head strength conditioning coach, or I want to only work with elite level athletes, or I only want to work with professional bodybuilders or whatever it is, right? This, this pie in the sky idea, dream big, right? That's, that's what they'll tell you. And up until this point, you've lived a very self-serving existence, right? That you've gone to undergrad, played sports usually, get into lifting weights. You went to grad, you went to this, this approach of, okay, well, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? Well, I like working out and I enjoy the process of development. So by extension, I should be able to do that for others. And then you realize very quickly, it's less about what you want. And you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices about your own personal development for other people, which is the job. If you're trying to parlay the knowledge and insight and the discipline that you've crafted and honed over years and years of exercise and training to others and get into this really important notion of your what is tied into working with people who can or won't. They can't do it. They physically don't have the ability to do certain exercises or go a certain duration. Then they won't do it. They won't get out of bed. They won't start a, a regimen. They won't follow a diet plan. And you're left with my value to them is less about what I know, but more what I can convey to them is important for them to do. Your infinite knowledge in terms of, I right, have spent a lot of money, time, energy, and resources into developing this very high level knowledge has created this disconnect to the people that you're primarily working with. And very simple, very logical, very sequent things pragmatic and thought, let's walk before we run. Let's do a body weight squat before we start to load up with a back squat. Let's start to do a set of five before we start to go really cranking on high level protocols and methods. And that will become the process and you become maybe disenfranchised over a certain period of time. But what you find is if you're more clear with what you want to accomplish as a good leader, mentor group, right? We know that everyone does better in a social dynamic that we're held accountable to the group, not necessarily to our own individual wants or needs that I have a reliance to other people to follow through because someone invested time into me. So the coaches that work for me, like I will give you everything I got. If you give me that in return and that's for your best interest and don't get it twisted that I have a mutually beneficial situation. If you're better, I can do more with my program. I can have a greater reach. You'll have more opportunity, which is the, the trade-off, right? The better coaches lead. It's the bad coaches that stay. The better coaches have opportunities. And maybe I had a hand in that. Maybe I just cultivated a really good environment where people feel the need to develop, grow, and improve every single day and being really good with basic fundamental aspects of strength conditioning. And then we get into your why, right? So what do you want to do? Want to do this? Okay, well, why do you want to do it? 
And if it has a disconnect with this, this what and why that they bifurcate in some way that, hey, my what is to work with elite level athletes. My why is to help people. Have you worked with elite level athletes before? Do you really help them? They're already really good. I want to work with intrinsically motivated people that have an incredible discipline and knowledge and bandwidth to handle stress and tolerate high level strength and conditioning. Do you really help them or do you manage them? Do you give them small insight? Like there's a fine line between helping someone that's already a really good spot versus someone that can't get out of bed, that is morbidly obese, that is struggling to make any progress, has a lot of body dysmorphia, a lot of issues with exercise and health. Like the, the, the percentile difference you can make with someone who's the majority of the population that can or won't is much greater. So when we dive into your why, and this is where I find most people are going to be with withholding of what they want because it shows their true, actual underlying desire. And remember, at this point, you've lived a very self-serving existence. And I'll get to why, how we're going to leverage your strategy here, but just bear with me. It's this notion that when I'm looking at my career, if I tell someone I only want to work with elite level athletes because I want to make a lot of money or I'm going to have a lot of notoriety, that would be perceived as less than, right? That we're doing this altruistic thing of helping people through exercise and nutrition. And I have maybe pretty vanity-based goals. That is not anyone's choice to judge other than you, right? And I would sit here and say that if I didn't have aspirations of being a high-level regarded strength and conditioning coach with a lot of pedigree and clout and recognition, I would be lying. If you ask anybody before the age of 30 what their goals are, they're going to be pretty audacious very, very self-serving goals that have some sort of output of high recognition, high notoriety, or high compensation. I am no different. Ask anyone what I wanted to do before the age of 30. It was pretty, pretty blinder focus, myopic focus on becoming a head strength coach. And what does that get me that I don't have already, right? I was already an assistant strength coach working with elite level athletes, making a really big difference having a big input, but I was competitive and I was focused on having the biggest reach and I wanted to have a bigger platform. What I didn't realize was, okay, my why wasn't really figured out that I wasn't prepared, not necessarily for the why, right? I was knowledgeable, I was capable, I was competent. I was really good at having a lot of expectations and holding people to those expectations, AKA standards. I was really good at it. But what became more and more obvious was the more higher you go, or the higher you go, I shouldn't say, that seems excessive or redundant, gets into this notion of the less you're actually doing the job that you were, that you were doing to get to where you were, right? So it's the classic, I work at a restaurant, I'm really the best server, I'm making the most on tips and I get asked to become a manager. You have to lose money. Somehow, some way, shape or form that I'm going to be transferred over to management and I'm going to be able to have this net impact on others, right? And I resent the fact that I'm making less money per hour if, and trying to teach people or motivate people to do things that I could do in my sleep. Right. And the same thing when you become a head strength coach, I have to manage other strength coaches. I have to manage their schedules. I have to manage hiring and firing or transitioning someone else new in. I have to manage multiple athlete schedules. I have to manage meetings. I have to manage all sorts of stuff. I become more of a liaison between what we're doing in the weight room to what we want to do on the field and connecting all the dots between admin, sport coaches, support staff, et cetera. I want to be a gym owner. Same, same story, right? I'm doing less coaching and more actual like management, HR, scheduling, hiring, and firing, et cetera, et cetera. Marketing, lead gen, all sorts of stuff that's not necessarily what I'm formally trained to do or what I'm interested in or I'd love to do. And all that has a big impact systemically on if you don't have a really good view of what you want and you start to figure out your why and that has some sort of lack of congruence with what you want, you should go back to either evaluating what you want that's more in line with your why, or maybe really do a more deeper introspection of why you want to do something. Because it's okay to have a big audacious goal. But what's not okay is if your why isn't congruent with that, because you're going to have to make concessions and compromises no matter which way you want to cut it. And that gets into the how, right? We talked about how in terms of motivation, knowledge, and skill. You need to have the motivation to, have the, to learn the thing that you need to learn to do your job and have the ability to actually do that job, AKA skill. But then it gets into this final aspect of strategy. It's a lot clearer 
the steps you need to take and the measures you need to go if you have a really dialed in what. I was pretty clear on what I wanted to be. And my ramp to that became better. So a classic example of this, I'm deciding to do continue education and the school I was working at with, and there's no knock on them. And the coaches that decided to go to this was, were, were great coaches. But I started to look at, I'm kind of getting lost in the sea of coaches who are going to the national boilerplate standard convention, right? The, the one that everyone's going to every single year, getting thrust into this, maybe potential networking, maybe good opportunity to see some great friends and people that you have strong relationship, like almost like a fraternity like event, learning other people's program, not really getting insight as to why, what they're doing or anything unique or different, basically just kind of a repackaged version of this. One of the best descriptions of that was Dan John. It's like all stream programs are the same, same as Mexican food. It's just some sort of combination of tortilla, meat, bean, rice, you know, kind of there. So a burrito is just a wrapped meat, bean, rice, right? Like that thing. Or if you look at a taco, it's the same thing, just with an open top. You know, everything is kind of roughly the same in strength and conditioning, same kind of mentality. So getting, you know, arguing over semantics of like, oh, I don't like to do a 15 minute one move prep. I don't like to start slow or whatever other notion of that. Like it just gets in these small, like subjective things that don't really move the needle versus I'm going to go to a, a conference outside of it. I'm going to learn a skill that no one else in this weight room has. And it could be way off or I could differentiate myself from this crowd and I become more valuable. And that was always the case, right? I was, I don't think it was an early adopter of certain things. I was just clear on everyone else is good in these other areas. I need to figure out a way to distance myself in order to fast track my career becoming a head strength coach. And when he made the choice of, oh, hey, we won't pay for you to go to a conference outside of this one versus the monetary compensation to compensation of being a head strength coach versus the short-term expense of going to a conference outside of what the school would pay for, it was a no-brainer for me. It was very clear. I would pay thousands, and I have, in the form of, I mean, I've talked about this before in this podcast, I've accrued over 600 or a hundred grand in terms of actual continued education for my ba bachelor's, my master's, continued education after my master's. Shoot, I even started a third master's degree that I did not finish just at this point. I didn't feel like it was like worthwhile, but that was what I, I focused on, right? And could I bring myself into this? And I think that's the part where most coaches kind of get, get off the beaten path and don't really have a clear strategy because the decisions that we make are either inherently obvious and in line with what you want to do or they're not. And if you don't have a really cleared in what your strategy becomes harder and harder to lay out. Right. And when you get this, like, Hey, you're not very good on the floor. And for you to be a head strength coach, you need to have a great presence. You need to be able to talk to a large group of people at a given time. You need to convey what you're doing to a sport coach or a business partner or a potential customer. There's all of these variables that are associated with being a really high level strength conditioning coach. Versus in the other end of, I love just being on the floor. I love being a coach. I love the college environment. I love being connected to the athletes. You have to figure out a way to put your ceiling on yourself and detract, detract from maybe someone potentially thinking of your head coach material and having a good inventory of that. And one thing I would like to make abundantly clear when you're looking at your strategy, it's the ones that will struggle with actually clearly defining what they want to do are the ones that are going to have a harder time making a strategy. That the, the less clear your goal, and it's one thing I hope to actually from this as well, I should say this, it's okay not to have a really dialed in goal and just enjoy the process, but you can't have both. You can't be this person that just generally enjoys strength conditioning, love being on the floor, love being there and have incredible aspirations and be upset when you don't, you get passed over for a job or a promotion or a raise. That there has to be a longer, more aggregate view of what you're doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis towards the career that you want to have and the compensation that you want to have and the position or the title that you want to have, there's got to be some sort of connection. And if you're just going to work every single day with your head down grinding, it's noble, it's great. I think that's what should be your focus and that should be the platform in which why you should get opportunity, but that's not the way the world works. And I don't want you to be the step over your dead grandmother to get a job type of mentality or sacrifice personal relationships or this camaraderie or this trust with your fellow coworkers. But you got to look around the room. If everyone could do the same things and they all do it at the same kind of subjective level, why would you get a promotion or a raise?
Why would you get anything? Why would you, why would you be different? If you're doing the same conferences, same reading the same books, doing the same things as everyone else in there, it's pretty hard to distinguish yourself as someone that's going to be a higher level than the other person. And then that process too, of like constantly evaluating yourself, like, how could I become better? That, that urgency to improve becomes less, ne less necessary. Like, Hey, can you watch my session? You know, and I'll, I'll be the first to say it's hard to get feedback. It's hard. I mean, no one likes it. it. It's definitely one of those ones where you're like, this burn just hurts. And I don't, I don't enjoy this. That's the, that's the process of being good. And you know what? Sometimes too, you gotta look at it from a lot of times that's subjective and you gotta be able to think, okay, that's information. And how do I evaluate subjective appraisal of what I'm doing? Is this the consensus? Is this what everyone generally feels about me? Or is this a whole different structure in terms of, okay, now I'm looking at this from someone gave me feedback. Maybe there's an attached agenda or bias associated with that, or maybe there's not. Maybe there's a, this person generally wants us to be collectively good and they're giving me feedback and information to improve so I can help this group. There's that part of it. Maybe it's just, hey, they just genuinely care about the people around them getting what they want and that's what they do. And maybe you should, by extension, do that for others. Peer-to-peer -peer feedback and re review is good. However, sometimes it's kind of clouded and, and put in this umbrella of, okay, this, this is hard to interpret considering there's some sort of attached agenda or bias associated with this. Which gets into this final level, right? So each phase kind of brings its own unique things. Undergrad, maybe grad school, maybe a 10-month position. Maybe you're working as a entry-level position, interning somewhere. Then you start to ramp into an assistant position full-time. Maybe you got benefits. Maybe you got enough to actually buy an apartment. Then you start to look at a top-level assistant. And then you start looking at your head jobs. Maybe you're looking at a top-level assistant moving down, taking a head job. Maybe you're like, hey, this is the time that I break away from the the football path and I move into Olympic sports and some of these sports are paying really well, some maybe not. And I start to just constantly looking at the, the trajectory, the, the path, right? The, the, how do I take a step forward constantly, right? Sometimes it's, I'm taking a, a perceived lateral move for increased compensation. Sometimes I'm taking less competition for a higher role, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's never ending process evaluating all this stuff, which becomes really chaotic. And you know, some would argue it's impossible to lay out a blueprint or a roadmap for your career. I would argue there's probably a really good opportunity to inventory the person that you most want to emulate and figure out what steps they took to get what they got. And it could be anybody, right? Let's say that I'm working in the, the team sector, sometimes referred to as the public sector, and there's a private strength conditioning coach that is just really killing it. They're like, that's the life that I find. Me they very likely could be giving you the best version of the life that they want to perceive as. So it's a little bit more exaggerated, but that's, that's that shouldn't kill the fantasy, right? The, the notion of I'm going to work from 10 to two, just pumping out content, working with a couple clients, making enough money to support me and my family, living where I want to live. Great. Or maybe it's i I'm a at your level assistant. I love the, the promise or the, the expectation of being a head strength coach and what that actually perceives to the outside world, right? The, the notion of you're seeing that person on wall street and they're walking into the, their office with a five piece suit and they're making millions of dollars and making all these big transactions that has an appeal to a person trying to get through business school, right? The same thing for strength conditioning. Like there's like this, but there's this avatar of the person that we want to emulate, right? There's an example before us and thank God now we have enough notoriety associated with some of these positions that we're aware of it and we can aspire for that. And that's, it's okay. Emulating success is a time-tested proven method. And when you're looking at your strategy, there's going to be different bumps and there's going to be different trajectories and, and redirects and getting off course, like all that's part of it. But the, the notion of there's that aspirational avatar, and this is gets into this almost self-fulfilling prophecy of, I want to be this. I'm going to keep visualizing it till I get it. There's that aspect that's so empowering and powerful. And you start to just simply ask yourself is every decision I make on a microscopic, a more intermediary between like every single coaching interaction, like I'm going to cue this, I'm going to manage these things, all this stuff, all the way through to the top of now I'm 
one step away from being from that position, what things do I need to do? Right. And there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of circumstance, but luck is when, when opportunity meets work ethic. And I think sometimes we devalue the, the conscious decision to work really hard every single day and not letting it be this self-fulfilling prophecy that we don't have any control over. But the other aspect, which is so critical, we make a lot of bad decisions all the time, all the time, right? We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our, our focus. We sacrifice our short-term thinking for long-term. And we talk a lot about this in our foundations course, but this first order, second order thinking models of first order is survival-based that I got to do something to keep my job or not get fired. How do I survive? Second order is I'm doing decisions that are going to have long-term payout. Then I'm making inroads, relationships, friendships, collaborating. I'm doing things to have this venture in there. I want to keep my day job to keep my benefits, keep paying my bills, but I'm going to start to build out a secondary source of income through online training or start writing blogs, or I'm going to start doing podcasts. I'm going to start doing out the, building out these things. So I have a little bit more, a little bit more opportunity if this thing doesn't work out, or maybe that's my true aspiration. I'm just choosing to do this. There's all these thought processes that go into every single strategy you make, which is kind of smart. And a lot of times young coaches are just reacting. And I think that comes back again to not really having a dialed in what, not having congruence with your why, and then therefore not be able to build a more robust anti-fragile strategy that it can handle a complete setting off course to keep moving forward, right? You're taking constantly steps forward. A one week might be a step back, but over time, that law of averages plays out to you moving forward more so than moving back. The last thing I want to note on this, and this to me is probably most near or dear to my heart, is this idea that at a certain point, you're going to change. You're going to have some sort of epiphany. One of the, the most common questions I get is why I left the team sector. And to be honest, it wasn't this like, profound epiphany that I had, I accomplished a goal. I was pretty locked in on, I want to be a head trade coach to the degree of like, I was willing to sacrifice quite a bit. I think I kept my integrity. I think the people I work with would tell you that. I think I kept my authenticity with my friends and my family. I think they still view me as the same person. I still have them in my life and I'm happy and proud of that. But I think all of them would agree that I was pretty focused on a goal in reaching that goal. Careful what you wish, for, right? That first step was becoming an assistant strength coach and then feeling the inevitable. I did four internships and thousands of hours of unpaid work to make $30,000 a, a year and working 70, 80 hours a week, traveling every single weekend, just generally not feeling like I'm appreciated to I'm on the, the precipice of giving it all up and just pivoting and going another profession to getting another opportunity and then not renewed me. And I was more online with what I wanted to be at the onset of being a head strength coach. And then I get the head strength coach and I'm there and I'm happy. I got a good life paid. Well, I have staff that I love and adore that will do anything and work their ass off every single day. I got athletes that believe in me. I have coaches that believe in me. And what you feel is a certain sense of where's the rush. Maybe it's a form of adrenaline. And that instead of cliff jumping, I need to have a new job. And at that point, you know, I could kind of see, okay, we're in a good spot. I could probably lay down some roots here. I can start a family. I can build out a really long run here, which is a really important thing for a lot of people. It just happened to me, not very important for me at that point. And I came in hot and the folks that would tell you that I work with army probably would tell them, say about me, it's either polarizing, like that dude changed some things or that dude was not a great person to work with because I was locked in. Like we had a culture to change we had something to do, but it was always short-term thinking. It was always, if I can win here, I can get a really big job somewhere else or have another really big opportunity. I never really went into this, like it's the last job I'll ever need. It was in my thirties. It wasn't something I was really conditioned to believe at that point. And that's at that point too, of like, once you get three years somewhere, you start getting anxious and antsy. And I didn't really appreciate the opportunity that it was, but I started looking at opportunities and looking around, man, like 
I don't have to work as hard to get people to do things that I want them to do as I did year one. And I felt less significant or valuable. I like that feeling of need being needed or being this person that has to be a catalyst to something that just simply doesn't want to change. And we did it. Mission accomplished. So when opportunity came from starting something from scratch with people that I genuinely have a great admiration for and respect for that I think would complement areas that I'm not very good in, I jumped at it. And you can say whatever it was, but you go back to my 24-year-old what, coming a head strength coach, into my 35-year-old, okay, now I'm a head strength coach. Next, what's next? Get another head strength coach job and just try to like, keep riding this wave as long as I possibly can? Or is it the next challenge? Building something from scratch and starting something that didn't exist before, making that into something special and big. And I'm proud to say I'm doing that. Still doing it. And I find that itch I got from, okay, well, we've been here for a while. We're doing the same thing. Same athletes, same problems. Freshmen are still knucklehead and coaches are still like crazy about their preseason plan and, and having these almost groundhog day like a response into now, like every three or four years, if I'm good, we're opening up a new gym. I have a whole new crop of staff. I got a whole new opportunity, members and clients. I'm like, that's, that is what I craved. It's this continuity and change revolution happen all the time. And if it's a better way to do it, I'm stepping to the front of the line and doing it. I don't want to be limited by, by the, the machine, so to speak, or this, like, this is the way we've always done it. So, you know, don't rock the boat too much, or if you've had great success and there's a, there's a limit to how much you can change without being compromising to the overall plan, but man, what an empowered feeling. And that's the part where you have to look at it from what is my what, what is my why, and is this still in the best interest of that what changed? And I go back to my why. And my why is I generally want to be the best strength coach I can possibly be. Whatever that means, whoever I'm working in front of, I don't care if you're 50 years old, never touched your weight in your life, or if you're 19 and you're a five-star recruit and you have unbelievable potential. Like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm still going to hold you to a high standard. If you show any bit of restraint or unwillingness to work, give me your absolute best, I'm not going to give you any compassion or empathy. Like you're not paying for that or you're not asking me for that, but you're asking me to be something that you need me to be. And when I look at you and I say, okay, you can do better. I am implored to do that. That is my value prop. And that's what ultimately my why is to be the best strength coach you can be. And that's learning. That's being a high skill, high standard individual. It's owning it every single day, coming to work every single day, busting my ass for the people that give me the opportunity to coach them. And it doesn't really matter where. And the what, you know, for me is more a matter of like circumstance. Can I provide my family? Can I have a roof overhead? Can we have things that we want to have, right? My family, yeah, we're like everyone else. We have, we have our, our things, you know, the, the luxuries of modern living. We like those things. And I don't want to deprive my kids from that. I don't want to deprive my family from that. I don't want to be able to make enough money to support that and facilitate that, but it's not my driver. It's not like I'm living and dying for every cent that I could possibly get and trying to accrue this wealth. So I would have gotten to real estate or something else would have a much bigger payout faster, right? This is a long, hard, slow road. And I enjoy being really good at it and I enjoy other coaches learning, growing and developing. I enjoy having discourse. I enjoy this fraternity that I'm a part of that the friendships and the relationships that we have through strength conditioning are as meaningful to me as any other relationship I have in my life. And that's important. I found my tribe and I want to, I want to pay homage to that tribe by giving back and delivering to it every single day. So I hope this is helpful. This is the end of season number four. Hopefully this stuff is kind of built into maybe have a little bit clearer indication. I'm, I have a feeling it's going to have some sort of evergreen effect where it's going to get more valuable over time. Maybe that's audacious, but either way, I hope I really appreciate you guys listening. Season five's coming up. Get on that actual phpodcast.com. Go to about and then put in what you want to talk about for season five. It'd be interesting to hear what you want, to, want me to talk about. Thank you guys. And we'll see you guys next season.